I'm not quite Superman. I couldn't make that change quick enough. I don't have socks on. <laughs> don't judge me. Uh, it's a great, great celebration to be able to celebrate. I love seeing young people make that decision and the, the faith. You know, you think about what Jesus said. The kingdom of heaven is made of such as, the, such as these. And so we celebrate with Nora today. If you get a chance to talk, she's got all kinds of family members and friends. Make sure you meet them and thank them for being a part of today. Um, we started a series last week entitled Rubble and just looking at uh, those spaces in our lives where maybe there's broken down walls and there's rubble that we know we need to do something with it, but perhaps we've walked around it, perhaps we've ignored it, and we've gone very long without addressing it. And you know, we, had, we talked about this idea last week that perhaps seeing it now, it's broken your heart and you want to do something about it, but maybe you don't know where to start. And a lot of times, I think we dive into devising plans and trying to figure out how we can manage it. But I think where Nehemiah starts in his addressing of broken walls is the right place for all of us to start, and that's with prayer. You know, a lot of times, prayer becomes a last resort for us. Once we've exhausted all of our options and we've gone through our whole list of, of plans or whatever it may be and realize we can't fix it, then we start calling out to God. Then we start praying. And I don't think that that has to be our pattern. I think that prayer should be the start of what we do, and prayer should be consistent throughout the entire journey of trying to rebuild walls in our life. For Nehemiah, prayer was the first thing he did often, and we'll see throughout his story as he goes to rebuild the walls in Jerusalem he prays before he does anything. And prayer was so important to him that he, he invested a lot of time in it. So we read last week that when he heard the news of the broken down walls, it was the month of Chislev, and uh, in their context, that was either November or December. And we'll read in chapter 2 that when he finally goes to the king to ask the king for permission to rebuild the walls, it's the month of Nisan, which is either March or April. So for four months, for four months, Nehemiah prayed. And he, he didn't dive into planning. He didn't dive into organizing. He prayed. He fasted. He wept for four months. And for, for many of us, we think that prayer is an inaction. I'm wasting my time. If I were to spend four months praying, it would be four months of wasted time. But the truth is, prayer is the greatest action we can take when the walls are broken in our lives. I love what John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, one of the, I think, the most translated books outside of the Bible, uh, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress, and he said this. He said, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Until we start there, we can't do anything else because until we know God's agenda, we can't step into God's agenda to rebuild the walls in our lives. So before you do anything else, pray. Why? Why pray before we do anything else? Well, I have some thoughts, and then we'll dive into the text. I think, one, to acknowledge your dependence on God. In prayer, we recognize that the situation is bigger than us, the situation is beyond us, and we can't solve it without him. We desperately need God's involvement in the situation. The truth is, if you're a believer in Christ, you are filled with the Spirit of God. However, Paul said, be filled with the Spirit of God, and he says it in the context of, do not be drunk with wine, but rather be filled with the Spirit of God. What he's challenging us to do is to be controlled, to be led directly directed by the Spirit. Because you and I, while we may have the Spirit of God through belief in Jesus Christ, we still have flesh. And so often our decisions in situations are driven by the flesh, and we need them to be driven by the Spirit of God. So we acknowledge our dependence on God. Two, we avoid being reactionary. And in praying and pausing and going to God with the situation, I avoid just jumping into answers or jumping into solutions that may not be the solutions to my broken walls. You know, it keeps me from reacting in my anxiety. Paul wrote this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. He says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request. To God. That word that he uses for anxious literally means to be in many pieces. 
And when I am in many pieces, my decisions, my reactions to a situation will also be in many pieces. And so he's saying, rather than being in many pieces, go to God in prayer. He'll later write that the God of, of all peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding, will give you peace in that situation. And I believe that he will put us in one piece in the situation. In fact, Peter wrote this. He says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. In prayer, or prayer becomes my greatest tool for dealing with anxiety and stress. And when presented with the rubble, and I don't know what to do with it, prayer becomes that opportunity for me to take it to a God who cares about me and wants what is good in my life and your life. I think also, we go to prayer first because we want to find the best course of action so if rather than being reactionary, we're ser- searching for the best course of action, which is God's course of action. God's course, God's plan for solving the situation is the best course of action. And God has a wisdom and an understanding and a perspective that we can't fully grasp. In fact, Paul says this in Romans chapter 11, or yeah, chapter 11, verse 33, he says, Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. There is a wisdom that God has that we will never fully grasp or understand, but that does not mean that he doesn't offer us wisdom. Jesus' brother James wrote this. He said, Now if any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly. He doesn't want to withhold that. He wants to offer it to you, and it will be given to him. So God has this wisdom and understanding the situation that's far beyond us, and God longs to offer that wisdom to us in the situation that we find ourselves in. We seek God's agenda. One of the things that I I love is that Jesus modeled that for us. When we see the Son of God, Jesus Christ, in his life and ministry, he models this pursuit of God's direction and God's agenda. John writes in his gospel over and over again that Jesus sought to do the will of the Father. But I want to show you something. In John Mark's account of the gospel of Jesus, he shares about a day in which ministry was filling the schedule. Jesus had spoken in the synagogue, he cast out a demon, he healed Peter's mother-in-law, and there's all this stuff happening. And he goes on to say, when evening came, so the whole day has gone by doing all kinds of stuff. When evening came, after the sun had set, they brought to him all those who were sick and demon-possessed. The whole town was assembled at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Now, I don't know if John Mark is using hyperbole when he says the whole town was at the door. There's a part of me, because maybe it's a smaller area, a smaller town, it may have been true that the entire community that Jesus was ministering to that day showed up at the door. And he's ministering into the dark hours of the night. We're not told, but I'm guessing the disciples crashed. Where does Jesus find himself before the sun even comes up? He's out with his father praying. And then the disciples come to him and say, everybody is looking for you. What I think they're saying is there's more work to be done. There's more ministry that we could accomplish here in this community. And what does Jesus say to them? Let's go somewhere else. Because my my mission, my agenda, God, the Father's agenda for me is to preach the good news. So Jesus, even in the midst, I think in that space, many of us would look and say, well, we should stick around. There's all this opportunity. There's, there's tons of ministry opportunity here. Let's stay here. And Jesus says, no, God's agenda is for us to move on. So for you and I, I think it's important that we go to God in prayer because we need to search for God's agenda in our lives. And then finally, I think we pray first before we do anything else because nothing of eternal significance happens without God. If I actually want to do or be a part of something that changes eternity, it has to involve the eternal one. If I want something to happen in my life and in my heart that is bigger than me, 
that is of eternal weight and value, it has to involve the eternal one. So before you do anything else, pray. And as you continue to do anything else, pray. It is our best course of action. So how should we? Well, here's my challenge for you and my challenge for me this morning. Pray like the walls have fallen. If you're standing in the rubble, and everything, is, everything has come crashing down and you don't know what to do with it, how would you pray? What would be the intensity of your prayers? What would be the fervency of your prayers? It breaks my heart that too often for me, and maybe this is true for you, it takes broken walls and rubble to finally push me to that place. And when all is good, And life is as it ought to be. I don't pray with that type of fervency or passion. I don't pursue God. But if I'm standing in rubble, I should pray like the walls have fallen. Nehemiah prayed that way. And I think we see, we have the beautiful opportunity not only to know that he prayed, but to know what he prayed. Because Nehemiah records his prayer for us. And I think to pray like the walls have fallen, it means we pray the character of God. I have to understand who God is, remind myself of who God is in the midst of what I'm going through, in the midst of the things that I'm addressing, in the midst midst of this rubble that seems like it's too big for me. I have to remind myself of who God is. In Psalm 121, the psalmist writes, he says, I lift my eyes toward the mountains. Where will my help come from? It's a song of journey as they're heading up into the mountains towards Jerusalem. There were all these potential dangers. And as he says, I look to the mountains, where will my help come from? He's expressing fear. He's expressing that there's something that could break him, destroy him. And he asks, where is my help going to come from? And his answer is, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of the heaven and the earth. The mountains possess great danger, but there is one who is bigger than the mountains who created the heavens and the earth. So he reminds himself of the character of God in the midst of his mountains. Another psalmist wrote, the earth is the Lord and every, is the Lord's and everything in it. Everything in this world belongs to God and he is greater than anything that I'm facing and anything that I'm going through. So in order to address the rubble, I must first pray the character of God. Nehemiah does that. He says, Lord, the God of the heavens, the great and awe-inspiring or awesome God, who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. Let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer that I now pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. Nehemiah begins and he prays to the God of the heavens. In their cultural context, they, many of the Persians, he's under Persian rule. Many of the people in the land of Jerusalem believed that there were gods over certain regions. That this God oversaw this region and this God oversaw this region. And Nehemiah is saying, no, there is a God who's above them all. The God of the heavens who controls all things and is above all things. And notice what he says first. God, the great God, the big God, the the massive God. When we're in the midst of the rubble, we think the rubble's big. We think our weaknesses are big. We think our inadequacies are big. We think the road ahead of us is big. You need to understand and I need to understand that God is bigger God is greater than the things that we are facing and the things that we are going through. God is above it. We must not say, God, I have a big problem. We should say, problem, I have a big God. He's bigger than anything that we face. And so in reminding ourselves of who he is, we can address the rubble that we stand in. Notice he also says that God is awe-inspiring or awesome. We have hijacked that word to death. Everything is awesome. Maybe you watched the Lego movie and you heard that. 
We say awesome to everything that we think is incredible or cool or exciting. There is truly only one who is awe-inspiring in the universe, and that is God. Literally, the word means on some level to strike fear. You know, you and I do not need to fear the rubble. We do not need to fear our opposition. We do not need to fear our weaknesses or, or our inadequacies. Those things need to fear the awesome God. So we remind ourselves of his, uh, ourselves of his character. And notice that Nehemiah says he is the God who keeps his covenants. But in the midst of the rubble, we remind ourselves that God is a God who keeps his word. God is a God who does what he says. Now for them, Nehemiah is speaking of a unique covenant, the Mosaic covenant. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 28 through 30, you can read part of that covenant where God says to the Israelites, if you do these things, if you abandon me and you reject me and you follow false gods, you will go into exile. Where do they find themselves? In exile. But he also says to them, if you return to me, I will bring you back to your land. So that's the promise that they live in. That's the covenant that they live in. You and I need to understand we have a greater covenant. Our covenant is not the Mosaic covenant in which God says, do this, you get, don't do that, you you don't get. Our covenant is found in the blood of Jesus Christ that says because of what he has done, this is true of me. And because of what he has done, he has promised he will never leave me or forsake me. He has promised that he will never take his love for me. He has promised that nothing can separate me from him. I do not live in the same covenant as Nehemiah. I have a better covenant. So when I remind myself of the promises of God, the character of God, I remind myself of what he said to me. I think one of the greatest ways for us to understand and know the character of God and his promises is to be in his word. God has revealed himself all through the universe, but one of his greatest revelations is in his word. How can I pray the promises of God or the character of God if I don't know those things? If I've not spent time digging into the Scripture to find what is God's character and what are His promises to me. The Israelites often would pray names about God. He is the God who heals. He is the God who provides. He is the God who is my shelter. They understood something about Him and prayed that. For us to understand that, we need to dive into the Word of God. And I believe that when we do, we will not only find His promises, we will find His agenda. And when I find God's agenda, nothing will stop God's agenda. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell are not being locked out. The gates of hell are trying to keep the church from pervading it and bringing light into the darkness, and Jesus says it won't succeed. That's his agenda. And so when I know God's agenda, I can pray with confidence. As we see, and we'll see later in this story, God would stir the hearts of the Persian kings. And if God can move the hearts of Persian kings, He can move the hearts of those involved in your rubble too. Nehemiah not only prays the character of God, he shows us that how we pray and praying like the walls are falling, we confess sins. We confess our sins. If you're standing in rubble, and the walls are broken down, it may be possible that you had nothing to do with it. It's very likely that you played a part in causing the rubble. And I believe it's important for us, if we're going to rebuild, to own our part in the broken walls that we find ourselves in. Nehemiah prays this. He says, I confess Notice, I confess the sins we have committed against you. Both I and my father's family have sinned. We have acted corruptly towards you and have not kept the commands, statutes, and ordinances you gave your servant Moses. From all I can understand as I study the story of Nehemiah, he's a pretty stand-up guy. He has great character. 
He seems to be godly. He seems to love the Lord. But yet, he does not exclude himself in the sins that have brought the broken walls in their lives. He owns his part in the cause of the rubble. And I believe that when we own our part in the cause of the rubble, the character of God is one that stands ready to forgive and cleanse us of our sins. That when I'm willing to confess sins in my prayer to God, He is more than willing to not only forgive me, but to cleanse and change me of my sins. John, one of Jesus' closest disciples, wrote this. He says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful. It is His character. It is His nature that when we confess, when we say the same, when I say this is exactly what you say it is, God, it is an offense to you and it's destructive to me and my world, He stands ready in His faithfulness and His righteousness to not only forgive me but cleanse me of those sins. Too often when we stand in the rubble of the broken walls of our lives, it's easy for us to see everybody else's fault in it and not to see our own. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this once. He said, you will never make yourself feel that you are a sinner because there is a mechanism in you as a result of sin that will always be defending you against every accusation. We are all on very good terms with ourselves. Isn't that true? We're all on very good terms with ourselves, and we can always put up a good case for ourselves. Even if we try to make ourselves feel that we are sinners, we will never do it. There's only one way to know that we are sinners, and that is to have some dim, glimmering conception of God. To catch a glimpse, even a dim glimpse of who God is, and his character, it's then that I could see where my character falls way too short. In his book, Gentle and Lonely, Dane Ortland says this, here's the reality of God's faithfulness in our sin. The culminative testimony of the four Gospels is that when Jesus Christ sees the fallenness of the world all about him, his deepest impulse, his most natural instinct is to move toward that sin and suffering, not away from it. When we study all of the Gospels, what we find about the character and nature of Jesus, who is God in flesh, Jesus said, nobody knows the Father unless they know Him. In all of the Gospels, we get the understanding that when Jesus saw sin and fallenness, his impulse was not to run from it, but to walk to it. So when I confess and recognize my character in in comparison to his, he is not pushed away from me. He is drawn to me. Thomas Goodwin said this, Christ gets more joy and comfort than we do when we come to Him for help and mercy. He goes on to say, He sides with you against your sin, not against you because of your sin. That's the character of God. And when I can confess my sins to Him, He stands ready to forgive and cleanse me of those sins. And I want you to notice that Nehemiah prays for his nation But he doesn't pray for his nation as if he's not a part of his nation. I think many of us right now and maybe for years have been praying for our nation, but perhaps we pray for our nation as if we are not a part of our nation. Nations are changed as states are changed as communities are changed, as churches are changed, as families are changed, as individuals are changed. Change in our nation starts with you and me. And so as we pray and confess, we make sure to include ourselves within it. And notice too that Nehemiah is not pointing the finger at God for the rubble. He's not saying to God, you caused this. He recognizes that you and I and our sin caused our broken world. What God created was good. 
We destroyed what was good. But God stands ready to forgive and to cleanse and to change. So we pray the character of God. If we're going to pray like the walls are fallen, we confess our sins. But again, we pray God's promises. Going back to the character and nature of God, we pray God's promises. Too many of us miss this mark. As we pray, we pray our expectations. We pray our desires. We pray our longings. We're not praying the promises of God. And then we become frustrated when God doesn't answer our expectations. We look at God as like the ultimate room service. That I can ask him for anything, he'll bring it, he'll make it happen, and the best part is, my credit card doesn't get charged. But that's not prayer. It's not, not how God behaves. God is seeking his agenda. And when I pray what he has promised, and what I know is true, and what he's already said that he will do in my life, I can be assured that he will answer those prayers. Nehemiah says this, please remember what you commanded your servant Moses. If you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the far horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I chose to have my name dwell. And Nehemiah is praying, God, you said that if we abandon you, we'd be in exile and here we are. But you've also said if we return to you, you'll return us to the land. And so, Lord, I'm asking that you return us to the land. I think often as parents, if you're a parent in this room, you know, sometimes we don't speak as directly or honestly with our kids because we know they'll hold us at their word. Justin, I don't know, Pat doesn't need to be up yet. It's too early, buddy. It's okay. Thanks, man. I think that we, we know that our kids are going to hold us to whatever we say, right? So a lot of times we're cautious about our words. We're cautious of promising. We're cautious of saying, hey, we'll do, if you do this, we'll do this later because maybe later we won't want to or maybe we won't have the means. God's not like us with his words. He's not cautious with his words. He has no need to be. If God said it, he meant it. And if God said it, he will do it. Because even if I am unfaithful, God cannot be unfaithful. He cannot be unfaithful to his own character, to his own nature. He remains faithful. So if God said it, he will do it. We cling to his promises knowing that he will do what he said he will do. And as I pray, like the walls are falling, I need to pray for his glory. Nehemiah writes this, he says to God, they are your servants and your people. You redeem them by your great power and strong hand. Please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Nehemiah says that you called them out to display yourself through them. You redeem them to declare to the nations around your name, your power, your strength. Lord, return them as a display of your power, your strength. My prayer in the rubble of my life is that God would show up and do something that in the end, everybody looking in, including myself, would say there is no other way that happened other than by the hand of God. I could not do it. Those around me could not do it. It required that a great and awesome covenant-keeping God would show up and do something in my life. My prayer is that in the rubble of my life, and I pray in the rubble of your life, that God would show up and do something that in the end, it declares His name and His glory that the world around you could say, I don't know how that happened, and you say, neither do I. Except I know the one who made it happen. One of my favorite individuals, maybe most humbling and impressive individuals I've ever heard of is a man named Nick Vujicic. I know I've shared about him before. Maybe you've never heard about Nick. Nick was born without any limbs. 
He joked that when he was younger and other kids were being made fun of for having big ears or wearing glasses, he was made fun of for not having arms and legs. And there came a point in Nick's life where he didn't want to live anymore. He didn't understand why God made him this way. He didn't understand what his purpose would be on this world. He wanted to take his life, but his fear of what it would do to his parents kept him from doing it. He was reading the scripture once, and he came across a story in John chapter 9 where the disciples and Jesus come, come across a man who was born blind, never saw. And the disciples in their cultural context believed that it was sin in that man's life or sin in his parents' life that caused him to be born blind. So they asked Jesus, who sinned? This man or his parents that he would be born blind. And Jesus says this, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. This came about so that God's work might be displayed in him. And when Nick read that text and understood it, he began understanding that God wanted to display a work in his life. And he started chasing after that. Over the years... Nick has spoken on over 24 different countries to millions of people about the love and grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he would tell you today, and he does all kinds of other things like surf and swim, like crazy stuff. He's a really impressive dude. He would tell you today that had he had arms and legs, he would not have the impact that he's having with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I'm going to pray like the walls have fallen, I pray that God's glory would be revealed in the renewal and the restoration of my broken walls. And again, I encourage you in your prayers to be ready to be an answer to your own prayers. Nehemiah closes his prayer by saying this. He says, give your servant success today. And grant him compassion in the presence of this man. At that time, I was the king's cupbearer. Well, who's this man? It's the king of Persia. And because of his role, Nehemiah had a unique opportunity to present something to somebody that could do something about the broken walls. Like I said last week, it wasn't skills that he needed. It was a broken heart and a willing spirit. And he had a broken heart and a willing spirit. And he was positioned in such a way that God could use him to do what needed to be done to restore broken walls in his life. I want you to understand, you are not positioned where God cannot work in and through you. Wherever you are, whatever you're going through, you are not positioned where God can't do a work in you. You do not possess a role or a place in which God cannot move. You are not beyond God's work and you have not placed yourself somewhere where God cannot get involved. His character, His nature is to rebuild and restore. He finds what is lost. He fixes what is broken. He heals what is sick. He frees what is enslaved. He washes what is dirty. And he breathes life into what is dead. That is his character. So if you're in the rubble, pray like the walls have fallen and pray to that God. Father, I ask that in the rubble of our lives you would show up that you would do something to transform, to renew, to restore where we cannot. That you would fix what is broken. That you would take even what we have done to cause brokenness and that you would bring forgiveness and cleansing. And that you would make new what we have caused to fall down. Lord, help us when it's difficult and we don't know what to do and we feel stuck and we feel lost to know that you are bigger, you are greater. Help us to know and understand that you are awesome, you are fearful, and the things that we fear must fear you. 
Father, help us to understand that you keep your word. If you said it, you will do it. It's not easy. And I know those who are in the midst of rubble could hear this and say, yeah, I get it. I hear it all. I understand it, but it's not that simple. And I, own, I know that. But Lord, I pray that we would remind ourselves of what is true of you what you've done in the past and what you've promised to do in the future. And I pray all this in the name of the one who's overcome our greatest brokenness, Jesus Christ, paid for our sin and brought us new life. It's in his name that I pray. Amen.